post and soil amendments. My name is Debbie Aller. I'm the Agricultural Stewardship Specialist with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County. I lead our Agricultural Stewardship Program, which aims to work with farmers in Suffolk County to reduce nutrient and pesticide inputs to ground and surface waters on Long Island. And one of the best practices we advocate for farmers to adopt is soil health management practices, including the use of compost and other soil amendments. Um, we have some great speakers today, our main speaker being Mark Hutchinson from the University of Maine. Um, it's great to have him here, lots of experience with compost, um, so we're excited to hear the talk from him. Just a couple housekeeping things before we begin. Um, all attendees today are muted um, with the videos turned off. If you have questions at any time, there's an option on the bottom of your Zoom screen to, it says chat. Um, you can enter your questions in that chat, chat box at any time. At the end of Mark's presentation, we will have questions for him. And then we will have questions again at the very end of the webinar, um, just before six o'clock. So, and also if you have any issues at any time, there's an option to raise your hand. This webinar is being recorded and a link will be sent out at the end of the webinar. Um, so you can view the presentations later. Um, please feel free to email either myself or Sarah, our information's on the registration flyer um, that was originally sent out if you have any follow-up questions at any time. So right now I'm gonna ask Sarah to please launch the poll questions. We have a couple questions, general questions about compost use. Quick questions, please answer these when they come up. And it's completely anonymous as well. So the first question, do you apply compost or other soil amendments to your farm? Click all that apply, multiple choice, just to give us an idea of, are people already using compost or other products? Um, there. So the votes are coming in. Okay, just over 50% of people have answered. I'm hoping people have heard of biochar, um, but that's a webinar for another day. All right, seems inputs have stopped. So Sarah, do you wanna end the poll please? And then there's one more quick poll question or you can share the results first. Just it is anonymous, that, okay. So most people are using compost. Some people have used mulch and are using manure as well, but no one answered for the use of biochar or compost teas and other extracts. So very interesting. So Sarah, you could stop sharing that poll and launch the second poll, please. So this is a question about accessibility. Do you have access to high quality compost and the quantity you need for your farm year round? This is something that often comes up in conversations with farmers in Suffolk County. So we are curious because we know we have people participating from other parts of New York State and possibly other parts of um, the region. All right, great. And so more than three quarters of you are saying you do not have access to high quality compost year round um, for your farms. So Sarah, you can go ahead and end the polling there. Um, thank you for sharing, answering those quick polls that gives us an idea of use and accessibility here. I'm just going to exit the poll. Okay, great. So 
now I'm going to introduce our first speaker for the webinar. Um, thanks very much to Mark Hutchinson, who is an extension professor with the University of Maine. Um, his education and research programs focus on soil health, compost processes, and utilization and animal mortality management. Professor Hutchinson is a member of the Maine Compost Team, USDA APHIS Compost Subject Matter Expert, and a certified crop advisor. He's involved in numerous composting projects, and he's been with the University of Maine for over 20 years. So he's a wealth of expertise, and we're very excited. Um, he was willing to share some of his knowledge um, with all of us here today. So Mark, I'm going to ask you to share your video and your screen at this time. Thank you again for speaking, and we will take questions at the end of Mark's talk. Great, thanks, Deb. Thanks for the invitation to speak today. Can everyone hear? Can you hear me? All right, Debbie. Yes, can hear and see you. Great, thanks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that I've done on compost applications, particularly around soil health and plant growth, and uh, how it pertains uh, to small vegetable and crop systems. If I can get my screen to advance. One of the first things we gotta remember is that compost is a soil amendment and not a fertilizer. Uh, too many people that start out using compost think it's going to provide a lot of plant nutrients to them. And that's a, that's a really a, a misconception in the compost world. It does have value and a lot, lots of value, but it's, it's not necessarily uh, like a bag of fertilizer. And so if you look at the, this is a nutrient analysis of compost from the University of Maine. So we can come look at the analysis. And if you look at the highlighted areas and on the right hand side, it talks about pounds per ton as is a material. So if you look down at the bottom, uh, you can see the different um, nitrogen fractions, the ammonia and nitrate. You know, we're looking at less than a pound per ton in this particular uh, compost analysis in this particular sample. And that is, that's pretty common of what we see uh, as far as a nutrient analysis for a lot of compost. So what is the real value of compost and how does it actually work in the cropping systems? This is oftentimes a mystery to people. One of the things about uh, compost is they are not all created equal. It was interesting to me to see the poll and see that people are having a hard time finding quality compost and quality is, uh, is defined in many different ways in the compost world, but you can see the wide range of, of analysis on these different samples and uh, the University of Maine lab, this is in um, 2009, uh, 2019 data. It, it, uh, we ran 122 different samples and you can see the just a huge variation in the different composts that come through our lab. Uh, and if you look at the total N, the TN percentiles, you know, from 0 0.02 to 3.8, there's just not a lot of material there, a lot of nutrients there. So that's why we consider a soil amendment, not necessarily a soil nutrient. So one of the things when you talk about quality and quantity you, 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 and the variability within those composts, it it's often goes back to what is that compost actually made of? So what is the actual feedstocks of those uh, compost materials? Is it a farm-based uh, that you see there on the left or is it a municipal compost which you see on the right? The farm-based material is generally uh, made out of things found on the farm, the manures, the, the waste feed, uh, with maybe some ad additional uh, additives such as wood chips or, or wood shavings to um, increase the bulk density or to increase the aeration of that particular compost. The municipal compost has a lot more variability in it because it's usually being collected from the local region. People are bringing different materials into the compost site, uh, into the transfer station or into the compost uh, company. 
uh, everything from leaves to twigs to branches to uh, lawn clippings. There's just a lot more variability in there, and it's uh, and it's managed a little bit differently too. So the quality and the quantity becomes uh, significantly different. The other part that, that uh, in influences the quality and also the variability is how that compost is actually made. Uh, there are a lot of different compost systems out there uh, that people talk about. Uh, everything from what you see in the lower left is just a, it's a, it's a local town here in Maine that uh, people can bring in their food scraps and their food residuals and place it in this bunk and it gets um, picked up by the front end loader and the, and the crew at the town uh, transfer station empties it when it gets full and mix it with whatever leaves and stuff comes in. But they just use a, a simple bin system uh, and a front end loader and turn it, you know, occasionally. It's, it's not something that's actively managed. In the upper picture in the middle, you see this is uh, what we have at the University of Maine on our main campus in which we do our food residuals from our five dining halls. It's, a, it's an in-vessel system. Uh, it's basically a roll-off container, an eight foot by 40 foot roll-off container with a uh, auger in the, in the system that actually turns and aerates the pile um, twice a day. But as it's turning and aerating, it's a, it's a um, serrated auger in the, in the mix so it actually reduces the particle size as well and kind of blends and um, chops up that material that actually is going in. You can put a whole watermelon, watermelon in the front end of it and by the time it gets to the back end uh, you can't find uh, anything that resembles that looks like a watermelon and, and that's um, it really makes a really nice product at the end of it but it's, it's also very expensive. On the lower right this is one of the commercial uh, operations that I deal with here in Maine. It's a turn windrow system. They use a Bacchus uh, machine to turn it, uh, but they are again collecting food residuals and they're using municipal leaves. So this is kind of a combination between uh, what you see at the university system and what you see at the towns. Uh, they kind of combine the two systems together and, and use a um, turn windrow in which they turn almost every other day these windrows are being turned when they're initially formed. Um, but as they turn those, one of the things that happens is that you lose uh, some of the nutrients because they get volatilized off, uh, particularly the carbon and the nitrogen, but it also increases the stability of that process the more that you turn. So there's pros and cons of each of the different methods that's out there, but again, it's what increases the variability. And this is why uh, knowing where your compost come from in the process is, is one of the important steps of using compost wisely. The other piece of the puzzle on variability is, is the maturity piece. So the time, how long has that compost actually been uh, processed? And the longer it's processed or the more mature it is, uh, the more stable it is and the, the less likely you are to run into issues with it. Um, bag products that you see here on the left, uh, and these are a couple of companies that we have in, in Maine, bag products are normally very mature and, and take much longer to process and to get to that point than you do in bulk. Uh, you can, bulk applications or bulk quantities are usually go out the door much faster. Uh, they are less processed, so they're a lot more volatile uh, and, susceptible to crop damage. But on the other hand, if they're less processed, less stable, they also provide a little bit more nutrient, uh, nutrients to the crop. So there's, again, it, it's timing, it's what you're looking for, but again, it increases the variability. And this is one of the complaints that we often get in composting is how variable compost can be from source to source and time to time. The other part that matters as far as the variability goes is how is that compost actually going to be used? So there, 
if you're a, a crop farmer, whether you be vegetables or nursery crops or um, agronomic crops, the, the, there's a wide range of uses for this material and everything from containers to high tunnels to fuel applications to, to landscapes. Uh, you know, we see compost being used in a wide variety of, of circumstances. And in each of those different uses, it is important to understand what the quality is of that compost and what the maturity is of that compost because plants are at different stages in different environments for those different types of, of systems. So we're gonna look at uh, some of the different uh, systems that you might use and some of the issues that you might run into. So I was asked several years ago to, to look at uh, producing some con container mixes uh, from a uh, compost operator and to uh, look at the issues around uh, some of the compost and why, why if people use their compost, they weren't having good success in germinations. And so what you see here is a, a, just a, a 96 tray that has, I think it's 96, but a tray with uh, different rates of compost uh, blended in with uh, a commercial uh, potting mix. So you've got 100% compost, you've got 20% compost, 50, and then a private blend, which was the blend that the, the company that I was working with uh, had, and then a 30%. And you can see at the 100% compost, there, the germination rate was absolutely uh, zero. And this was uh, across many different trays, across many different uh, seedlings that this happened. And what happens when you use 100% compost, there's there are a lot of several different things. One, if it's not mature, you get some volatilization going on and you can get ammonia toxicity taking place. But more likely that this material is still so biologically active that it it is taking oxygen out of the out of the soil and doesn't allow those natural processes to to actually carry out. And even at 50%, you can see that the germination uh, and the growth was was in in that it impeded by, by the compost or hindered by the compost. And it wasn't until you got the 30 or even 20% that you started to see some, uh, what, what I would call typically uh, a normal seeding and growth rate in, these, uh, in this lettuce. And the private blend was, <clears throat> was obviously poor as well, excuse me. <clears throat> it, uh, it was somewhere around the same, germination rate is the 50% blend. Um, so this, this compost operator was kind of disappointed because in that blend was significantly more, it was somewhere between 50 and 100%. Um, of course, they're trying to make sell the compost, so the more they could put in the blend, the better it was for them. They can move more product, but in reality, their customers weren't satisfied and they really need to back, back that off. I did some work in some raised beds to, to also look at uh, what happens when you add compost in raised beds or small can, smaller units. Uh, in the upper left is the control, and this was just native soil. Uh, these are peppers being growing. And if you go around clockwise, 10%, uh, 25%, 50%, uh, you, you see that there's a, a difference in the plant growth. But if you look at, if you look at the Yield data on these, uh, obviously the control was very poor because there wasn't a lot there. Um, and the 10% was, was better. The 25% was actually the best, even though the plants don't look nearly as good as the 50%. But if you understand pepper growth, you don't necessarily always want those big, bushy, healthy plants because it's when the plants stressed a little bit is when they actually put out the best peppers. and at this 25%, uh, we've, got, we've got optimal yield results at that 25%. We got pretty good results at 50%, but not economically different than the 25%. So why would you spend the additional cost of adding the additional compost in if you're not gonna get any yield result, real benefit from it? So uh, that's something that we often see is that we can get a yield benefit from a smaller amount and the additional amount of compost added to that system is, is just a, a, 
to me, it's a waste of, of money at that point in time. Myself and Dr. Hutton have been doing a, a long-term uh, high tunnel study, looking at tomatoes and the, and the fix of compost rates. Um, we've done, uh, these are in cubic yards, so everything from 10 all the way up to 90 cubic yards uh, per acre is the rate that we use. And looking at marketable fruit and also marketable weight, one of the things that you notice is that as you go from 10 cubic yards to 20, to, to 50 to 90, you actually start to see a slight decline at the 90 cubic yards per acre rate. It's not a statistical uh, difference, but again, it's, it's this idea that if 20% is gonna give you the same markable fruit and the same markable weight, why spend the extra money and time to add in that extra compost? Uh, so it is at 20 cubic yards that, that we really focus on to, to reach that um, growth curve that we want and the yield production rates that we're looking for. There are a lot of different field applications for this uh, material. So uh, in the upper left, this is, uh, we front loaded some strawberries on plastic culture. Uh, that's an, a perennial crop. Um, uh, two years or better. So in those crops, we want to load the beds and then we lay the plastic. Uh, it is uh, a good practice because once that plastic's down, it's really hard to add any more additional compost to it. Um, you can see us laying the beds here in the lower left. Uh, you can't see the compost, but there's been compost added to it. And that's actually being incorporated as we pull, pull the beds. The Picture on the right is uh, peppers in, in greenhouse production areas. This is actually in Jamaica. Uh, again, we're gonna front load these uh, because they're gonna be in the ground for so long. So if you're using it in a perennial cropping system, it's a different application rate than if you're using it in an annual cropping system. Work on some uh, acorn squash, uh, the, the picture closest to you or the row closest to you actually had a compost application rate of about 30 cubic yards the acre. You can see that the plants uh, are fairly healthy. This towards the end of the season, we were just about ready to harvest. Um, the next row over did not receive any compost and you can see that there's significant plant uh, vegetative difference. There's also significant differences in yield. Um, and then the, the last row that you can see on the top was also with compost. So it, it makes a difference. Uh, and what we found in, in this particular scenario is that it, the nutrient content of the soil was not significantly different, but by adding the compost, uh, the growth pattern certainly was different. This is a uh, green beans in uh, central Maine. Um, working with one of our growers down there, you can uh, see the compost application uh, along the blue flags on the right. I don't know if my pointer shows up, but along the right hand side, there's blue flags and then there's a kind of a spot of, of where you can see the compost was applied. But you can also look, see where the color changes in the four rows of, of beans. And, uh, this grower happened to call me up one day and said, Mark, he says, I'm plowing those beans under there. They look horrible. They're not going to produce a crop. You know, I don't want my fellow farmers to see and I'm doing such a poor job. And I was like, oh, Rick, just hold on. Let me come down and take a look and see what's going on. And, and uh, this is a grant project. So I said, let's hold on and wait a couple weeks and see what happens. And, he said, and I said, I'll pay you for the crop if it if it's a complete failure. But one of the key things to point out in this picture is where the color changes is he's a conventional farmer. So this is where he actually shut off the fertilizer belt. So the, the background picture where it's nice and dark green, they receive um, conventional fertilizer through the fertilizer hopper. Uh, and then he shut the hopper off and planted uh, where I had put the compost uh, because I didn't want any additional uh, starter fertilizer or 
amendments at that point in time. We wanted to see strictly what the effect of the compost was. Two weeks later, I go down and same flags on the right hand side, and you can see what a difference it's made over time. Uh, so it, when you're using compost, a lot of times you have to just be patient and then understand how that compost actually works in the soil and works to supply nutrients or supply the, the soil nutrients to the plants. Uh, it's not a quick green up. It's not like adding urea to, to a crop and then having it green right up or having a starter fertilizer there. It takes time. It's a biological uh, type of soil amendment. You're feeding the soil and that soil has to, to work and the biological activity in the soil has to work in order to, to feed the crop. So it's a, it's a little bit longer uh, system or cycle to get the nutrients to, to the crop, but they will get there eventually. We're also looking at, uh, we're in our sixth year of a permanent bed uh, system where we're looking at uh, different types of mulches and tillage practices and compost is one of our, our mulch practices. Uh, and we're, we're starting to see, you walk in this field when we first started six years ago and it, it was basically rock hard and, and it didn't have a good feel to it. You walk into it now and some of the compost sites and, and the straw site as well, uh, and it's, it's kind of like walking on a spongy cushion. It's a, it's a much different feel. So the soil tilth has changed tremendously over those six years. And, and we've seen uh, a big change in our yields over time. This, this year we actually grew beets. So this is the, a beet crop that you see here. And this is from 2020, this, this current year. Uh, but we've tied those mulches in with also tillage practices. So looking at the combination of using composting and tillage uh, to improve soil health and to, to see what effect uh, those different practices have on yield production. Uh, I'll just make a plug. This is, uh, this is in collaboration with uh, Cornell University. Uh, they have plots in um, outside the Ithaca and uh, Freeville uh, that is doing the same thing. And so this is a, a collaborative project between the University of Maine and, and Cornell. Compost application rates here, this is used as a mulch. So, it's, and it's uh, originally it was designed for weed control. So in this case, we were putting down about two to three inches of compost uh, on beds. Um, it is very expensive. It's a, a rate of somewhere around 60 to 90 cubic yards the acre at, at that two to three inches. And it, did it work on weed suppression? uh somewhat but not not any better than just uh, normal cultivation or uh some of the other methods that we that we've looked at it so it, it, it wasn't great at suppressing weeds i guess is the, the conclusion that we're coming to so the question becomes you know compost as a soil amendment you know how does it actually work and what's the what's the goal behind it so compost as, as a group it, it Really what it does, it doesn't add nutrients, but it increases the ability of the soil to hold nutrients. And I can't stress that enough. So if you have nutri nutrients already in the soil, and by adding compost, it's going to make those, com those nutrients stay in place uh, and make them more available to the plant over time. So it increases the soil's ability to hold nutrients and increases the nutrients availability to the plant and also increases the buffering capacity. So we know that pH is a really important piece of, of farming for a lot of crops and having that you know between six and seven, six and a half uh, is really important. Most compost that you get and I don't care the quality, the maturity uh, to, to some degree is going to be somewhere around 6.8 to 7.2 but it's going to have tremendous buffering capacity. It's, it means that the pH is going to hold pretty steady over time. So it's going to increase the value of your lime application as well if you need to add lime. 
And the question becomes, how, how does it actually work? So we know that plant nutrients are either cations or anions, and you, you know, your major nutrients, your nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, um, you know, your calcium, magnesium are, are basically cations, uh, and potassium is cation, so they have a positive charge. Well, compost as a rule, just like soil, is negatively charged. So the more negative sites that you have, uh, the more cations that can be held in place and the cation exchange capacity increases significantly when you increase the amount of organic matter or you increase the amount of compost into the soil. So it's this increase in organic matter in your soil and increase in the cation exchange capacity is really where you, where you get the biggest uh, bang for your dollar when using compost. Along with, you know, other, you know, water holding capacity, increased friability, uh, increased soil structure. Uh, but as far as a nutrient goes, it's this cation exchange capacity and, and um, negative sites that really make a difference. If you look at this cation exchange capacity, you, you look at a sandy soil, um, I don't know a whole lot about soils on Long Island, but I assume that some of them are pretty sandy out that way. Uh, we have a lot of clay soils in Maine, but the cation exchange capacity and, and soil textures are pretty low compared to what you get in organic matter and particularly compost. Uh, you know, it's anywhere between three to 10 times greater number of negative sites. So, that's really your benefit, the, the idea that you're going to increase that cation exchange capacity and be able to hold those nutrients in place is really the, the, the key to adding compost. So some suggested application rates, you know, we talked about, uh, I briefly mentioned different types of cropping systems, but if you're growing a perennial crop, strawberries, asparagus, uh, some of those crops, you wanna front load the system so it's uh, somewhere between 20 to 30 cubic yards to the acre. If you're doing row crops, an annual row crop, I would drop that back to somewhere between 10 to 20 cubic yards to the acre because you can add it on an annual basis and you're not overloading that soil uh, and, getting, and you're staying within that yield curve that you want. If you're dealing with a home garden, uh, you know, we put it on a per thousand square foot. It's about six cubic feet per thousand square feet. Uh, so a 20 by 50 garden, you're looking at, uh, you know, six of, six of the bags that you may get out of a garden center from bag compost. Turf and lawn is getting to be a, a, a big business uh, as far as adding compost and what it is. And so between three to five cubic yards, and that's, uh, can be done twice over the course of a year. Uh, and that's on a per acre basis. So it's a really, really um, small amount of compost. And it, uh, but what you're doing is you're, you're kind of feeding that biological system uh, in the soil. So that's, that's an, what you want to think about when you're adding this three to five yards in the in turf and actually in, in all cropping systems. And container mix, you know, we're talking about uh, somewhere around 25% by volume is really the max that uh, is the optimum rate that you're looking for. Uh, so when you're, if you're using it to uh, amend your container mixes and seedling mixes, you know, 25% by volume, anything greater than that, you know, you start to see a real decline in uh, seed germination and a, a lot of uh, injury can take actually take place uh, if you get much greater than that. People oftentimes ask me, you know, boy, 20 to 10 to 20 cubic yards is not a lot. And the way that I often describe it to people is that if you eat mashed potatoes and you put pepper on your mashed potatoes, you don't put layers of pepper on top of your mashed potatoes. You just put a little bit, uh, sprinkle it on top to it. Uh, it just kind of flavors it. And that's kind of the mindset that you need to think about with composting is that you're just adding a little bit of flavoring to that soil and you're actually feeding the soil microbial uh, diversity in that soil to, to, to work better for you, to actually to grow and to, to provide nutrients eventually to your cropping system. So think about adding compost much like you add pepper to your mashed potatoes, just a, just a light sprinkle. 
I do want to bring up uh, another issue that's come up to light several times over the last you know half a dozen years, and these are these are persistent herbicides, um, and these are particularly found in a lot of composts that are made from municipalities or from that take on lawn clippings, and these are uh, persistent herbicides. Uh, the active ingredients, as you can see there on the left, the picolaran, the clepyrolids, the aminoclepyrolids, and aminocycloclepyrolids uh, are all part of it. Um, they're made by a variety of different uh, manufacturers and trade names. They're basically used as a broadside, uh, broad, uh, broad leaf uh, herbicide in forage production and grass production. Uh, they are, they do stay in the grass clippings. They do stay in the forage. They actually pass through animals. They stay in the manure uh, and they actually are persistent in the compost if they end up in the composting system. Uh, what they are is they are synthetic uh, auxins, growth hormones. And what you'll end up with is uh, even in very small quantities, you'll end up with uh, looks like herbicide damage uh, from the compost, the twisted leaves, yellow leaves, uh, particularly if you're using this compost in container mixes or on broadleaf uh, vegetative plants. You won't find it in alums, you won't find it in uh, garlic, but you will definitely see it in um, broadleaf plants. And this is uh, can be a, have an effect at even small parts per billion. But if I go back to the slide, all, every compound that you see here, every uh, herbicide you see has a, a legal label and it says that, that if this material is used, the byproducts, whether it be the feed, the forage, the manures cannot be added to compost um, because it will actually persist through the composting process and cause crop damage. So with that, I'll take questions. Great, thank you, Mark. That was that was very informative, and you have some great research going on. And I'm glad to see you're cooperating with, uh, partnering with Cornell on some of your work. That's really great. So we've had a couple questions come through, and um, I think we have about five or ten minutes of your time left um, for for that. I know you need to run to another meeting. So um, first question. That's. First one's not going to be for Mark. That's more of a Long Island soils question that we can touch upon later. But one, how do you reconcile the 0% germination in the 100% compost in the tray experiment versus the good looking beet crop in the two to three inches of compost mulch from the other experiment? Good question. So when you, when you have 100% uh, compost in the containers, it, it is in a very, very small environment and it's strictly just the uh, container mix. So when you put the two to three inches of mulch out in the field, you're actually, when you actually go to plant, that is just basically surface applied. It's not down where the roots are. It's not down where the crop is actually growing. It is basically a surface application. And over time, what's going to happen is you're actually going to blend that. Uh, it will actually get pulled down by the earthworms and other microorganisms. Uh, but it will never be 100% compost in a field application. So it will be, you know, 30% max, uh, even at the inner surface. Great. Thank you. Um, please, if you have questions for Mark, now is the time to, to ask them. So please just enter them in the chat box. Um, and while we let people enter in any questions they may have, um, Mark, I have a question for you. And it's re re often a question I get from growers around here is related to compost reports. And how to, what are the key things for a farmer to look for on a compost analysis um, if you know they aren't don't directly work with their extension office or soil and water um, or NRCS directly if a farmer is conducting their own compost analysis what are some of the key things they should look for on that report so there are really two 
a couple of different things that I look at. And I'd look at if, if they have it analyzed by a lab, whether it be University of Maine or, or Cornell, I haven't looked at Cornell's lab lately, but I look at the bulk density. And then I also look at the conductivity. The conductivity is a measure of salinity to see if there's um, high salts. One of the things when you're dealing with food waste composting, I can almost tell that it's food waste composting or a sea-based compost because of the salt levels. Um, food waste because of the, a lot of it's coming from institutional food and which are very high in salts. Uh, and if you'll get conductivity rates of over six to eight to nine to 10 uh, millimoles and that's way too high for plant growth. You want that to be below four. Um, and it's a simple solution just to let it leach out over time, let it rain on and so on. The other one I look at on ours, and, and I, can, I can show you on ours if you want me to go back and share that analysis. Uh, it is, it is um, at the very bottom, we'll talk about the different nitrogen fractions down here at the bottom. We'll talk about nitrogen fractions. And if you can look at the second column where it says 58 and 183, that really, that, that ammonia level should be down in the single digits. Uh, so to me, that's still telling me that that compost is starting to be mature, but it is still relatively immature. And also when it has a C to N ratio of 11.7, 11 that C to N ratio would actually want to be up around the 18 uh, to one ratio. So those are the, those are the, I, I've actually had got them highlighted there, the bulk density, the conductivity, and then the, the ammonia and the nitrate levels are the four first things that I look at uh, in a compost sample analysis. Great, I think that will be very helpful. Um, and actually you already answered um, a question someone just put up um, about the carbon to nitrogen, nitrogen ratio that should be aimed for in mature compost, which is about 18 to one carbon to nitrogen there. Um, second question was, does compost have to be aged once it reaches over 140 degrees before being applied? So I'm guessing this is talking about the curing phase of compost. Yeah, that would be my guess. So, so one of the interesting things about composting is that anything that's used in the composting process, could it actually be added directly into the cropping system before it goes into the, into the composting system? I mean, we used to add fish, right? The Indians used fish into the, into the underneath the plant. So uh, we don't practice putting food waste into it because of, of a lot of other issues. But um, so it really depends again on the end use. If the end use is a pumpkin cropping system where they're high nitrogen uh, tolerant and they need a lot of nitrogen, you can put very immature compost into that system. So it really wouldn't need to be cured that much. But if you're putting it into a nursery crops, nursery system or a potted plant system, high, high tunnel tomatoes, uh, then you're starting to look at you need to actually cure that out. And that curing time can be anywhere between three to six months. Uh, again, it really depends on what your end use is going to be for that compost. The, the more immature the compost is, the more nutrients, soluble nutrients there are, uh, you know, that people are looking for, particularly around the lines of uh, nitrogen. That was some of the first work that I did was on fish compost and looking at timing of when it can actually come out of the pile and when it's going to do crop, be most crop beneficial and actually still meet the organic national standards. Great. That's, that's great. I think it answers the question there. Um, we have another question about uh, if a farmer has access to compost made from grass clippings, which is very common here on Long Island, both grass clippings and just yard waste compost, um, do you recommend testing for herbicides or other chemicals? And if so, any labs specialize in that? So the answer, the short answer is yes. Uh, particularly if you, again, depends on the end use. If you're putting it on lawn, it's not a big deal because that's what the herbicide was intended for, was to for lawn or forage application. If you're putting it in garden or a commercial vegetables 
scenario, then absolutely. And it, you don't need to send it to a lab. It's, it's fairly simple. You can actually just take a, a potting tray uh, and put in some uh, watercress or some beans or peas work really well. Let them germinate, let them grow. Um, with peas, if you let them reach the tendril stage, they'll start to show those signs of herbicide damage fairly quickly. Uh, those are the three best systems. They germinate fast, they, they grow fast, and they show the herbicide uh, in, the, in the compost really quickly and really well. So it's just a bioassay type scenario. There are labs, but when you start testing for herbicides, it's hundreds of dollars per uh, herbicide. And if you don't know which herbicide you're looking for, you can run into thousands of dollars really quickly. So I tell growers all the time, let your plants do the talking, just you know, put it in the greenhouse, put it on top of the refrigerator, whatever, whatever you have, uh, just do a bioassay uh, early on. I think that's a, a really great, quick, low cost recommendation for farmers, a little bioassay, bio they have everything available to them right there. Um, I have another question about turning during the aging process, so during the curing process. Do you recommend turning a pile, for example, in windrow composting? So once, the, once, the, once you have set your windrows and the, the, you've turned them, say you've turned them three times or four times and, the, and you turn them the last time and the temperature doesn't come back up, um, that's a really good indication that the, the thermophilic stage or the heating stage is, is done. And at, at that point in time, you really don't need to turn them uh, afterwards. They can sit in large piles. They, they are going into a really, fairly slow period of curing and slowing process. They don't need nearly as much oxygen because there's not the high level of biological activity. And that's really what creates the heat. People sometimes miss that. It's the biological activity in the compost that actually creates the heat. It's the, 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 the metabolism. So when there's not the heat, there's not that much not as much biological activity, uh, so they don't need as much oxygen, so they can sit over a period of time and not be turned. Excellent. Thank you for that. Any more questions, please um, send them in. I will ask another one. Um, besides the bioassay test for farmers, if they are making their own compost, are there easy um, ways for them to know it's mature? Um, or ready for application um, without needing to pay for a lab compost analysis? So I, again, I go back to what's the end use of the product? You know, how is it gonna be used? And that really becomes a critical point for people to understand maturity and stability. But there's also something called the Selvita test, which you can do yourself. It's a four hour test. It's, um, it's about $18. It, it measures the amount of uh, carbon dioxide, um, being released by the microorganisms and also the amount of ammonia in the in the in the compost at that point in time it's a volumetric one so you have to use the container right size container and it comes as a kit but um and then it, it, it's kind of like the old math tables you come down on one side and you come across the other time where they come together the, it gives you a number usually somewhere between one and eight uh, and you can see what the maturity level is at, at that point in time. And then you can determine what the appropriate end use would be. If it's really low, then it needs to be field applied for agronomic crops. If it's high, then it can go into container mixes uh, and into uh, like potting mixes and, and seedling mixes and so on. Great. Um, I think we have one final question before I know you have to go off to another meeting. Um, last question is, can it can compost ever be too mature? So it, it, it cannot. I mean, it, it, it's as it matures and ages, uh, the, the value of it remains the same as far as being able to hold its uh, CEC levels. Um, what you start to lose is a little bit of the nitrogen fraction because that's, um, that's lost as it matures, but it still has a lot of value as far as a soil amendment and being able to hold those nutrients in place. So uh, there is no such thing as bad composting. It's just a, a matter of understanding the different uses of each types of compost that may be out there. Great, excellent. 
Thank you for those questions. Um, if there are no more questions. People are welcome to email me too. If they, if you want to share my email at some point in time, they, they're welcome Absolutely. to email the questions. Great. Absolutely. We'll, we'll send that out um, after with, along with the recording to all the attendees um, and panelists as well. Um, so people are saying thank you and very helpful. So thanks very much for your time, Mark. We'll round of applause from Great, everyone. Thank you. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, we'll follow up if there are any questions. Great. Thanks. So, enjoy. enjoy the rest of it. Yes. Thank you. And you're welcome to stay on if you do have the time. But now we're going to move on to the second part of the webinar this afternoon, evening. Um, and we are, if Amy and Olga from NRCS could share their screens first, that would be great. Um, so Amy Langner and Olga Vargas are two NRCS soil scientists in New York. I will let them say more about their backgrounds if they care to share. Hopefully many of the people attending this webinar know of them. Um, they're great, uh, work with them fairly closely, and they're gonna talk about um, one of the new standards in New York State and what that means for soil amendment and compost use um, in New York. So I will let Olga take it away first. Thanks, Deb. Um, so my name is Olga and I am the resource soil scientist um, for NRCS and I cover Eastern New York. And I am going to go into some soil health indicators um, before Amy goes into the standard. Um, and these are some field indicators um, that we can all use to see um, if we can benefit from soil health practices like soil carbon amendments. Um, of course, NRCS has their four principles of soil health that involve you know, keeping the soil cover, having living roots, having biodiversity, and minimizing disturbance. And that last one is, I feel like, often the, one of the hardest ones. But the overall goal is to, you know, our soils are living systems to make sure they stay healthy and making sure our microorganisms are nicely well fed. Um, you know, we often talk about the four components of soils, and as, well, as much as I love that pie chart because it's in every soils um, course we've ever taken, uh, I feel like it doesn't really do organic matter um, as much justice as it really should. Um, that organic matter, even though it's five, only a little 5%, I mean, hopefully sometimes more, um, it, it really is so important because it, you know, there are different types of organic matter and we really need to maintain that balance between having stable organic matter and that active fraction of decomposing organic matter and constantly um, refreshing that cycle so that the living organisms, which are, again, are only a little 5% out of the other 5%, but they play such a big role in um, building our soils and making sure they're healthy. You know, I often think of our mineral component of our soil as the bricks of our soil and organic matter um, helps provide the mortar that we need to keep those pore spaces open um, so that our air and water can flow. And, you know, that mortar in our soils comes from the plant exudates and you know, the plants get their nutrients from decomposing organic matter that, you know, all that work that our bacteria and fungi are doing. So it really is a whole cohesive ecosystem underneath ground. And we really need to make sure all those components are working. And it really starts with that cycle of organic matter and making sure we have those active fractions of it and working in there so that our microbes are nice and happy and fed. Um, so I'm going to go over field indicators um, that we use to look at a site and to try and assess, you know, how can I benefit from um, soil health practices that will help improve my soils. So one of the first um, indicators I'm going to go over is surface cover and residue background. 
And, um, you know, a lot of these indicators you really need to keep into context the time of year that we're, you're looking at them. So if you're going to watch your progress, um, it's really important to assess your soils the same time every year and, and write notes about the, you know, the weather that year. You know, was it a crazy dry summer like it was this year? Or, you know, was it particularly wet? I, I try to keep things within, the, within that context of the local environment. Um, so when we're looking at surface cover, that is our live plants and our residue. Uh, but when we're looking at, at our residue, um, of course, that also needs to be, I feel like all of these have little caveats. You know, we have to keep it into the context of what we're looking at. You know, are we looking at soybean residue that breaks down really fast or, or, um, or corn residue that lasts a little longer? You know, if we're looking at our mulch, you know, our, is our mulch from, you know, oak leaves, is it from maple leaves? You know, the maple leaves will break down a lot faster and the oaks may take a couple of years. So, you know, is it a, or a mixed bag of it? So we want to see what that residue is doing. And if our residue is not breaking down, that kind of is like, uh-oh, why are our microbes taking care of that residue? Are they not there? You know, some it's just a, a visual indicator of maybe something's going on with our system that, you know, we're trying to feed our soil, but it's, it's not breaking down and, and something may be wrong. Um, so the, our next indicators are surface crusting and ponding. And I always think of, um, you know, when we think of bulk densities and increasing on the surface, um, it's usually through a lot, losing that pore space that I mentioned that is so important. You know, if there's something wrong with our brick and mortar, you know, do we not have those organisms um, in there and their biological glues? Are we missing the exudates for, you know, and the sugars from our plants? Like what's breaking down? And, um, you know, and there's a spectrum to all these things. You know, I sometimes tease people that it's kind of hard to see compaction on your own farm, but it's easier to see it on someone else's. But, you know, not to judge yourself too harshly, but remember there is a spectrum. And, you know, even if you have an issue, you know, how can I treat that issue now before it becomes more, it deteriorates and becomes more severe. And if you're gonna have compaction, I'd rather you have it on the surface than in the subsoil. It's definitely easier to treat it on the surface. And all the types of soils will have increased bulk densities um, on the surface when they're subject to um, heavy equipment and when, when they're um, overused a little bit, you know, whether they're really sandy systems or, you know, organic um, soils, they, they can all suffer from a little surface crusting or ponding. And it doesn't matter if it's a high tunnel vineyard or a, a traditional um, corn and soybean system. Um, you know, we all have issues with um, surface pressing and ponding at times. Um, and then this, again, you know, keep it within the context of your local weather. You know, you don't want to go looking at, um, for surface pressing or ponding. Um, you know, with ponding, especially you want to go out there after a rainstorm event. You don't want to necessarily do it in the middle of the summer. Um, so then our next, um, field indicator is penetration resistance. And we do have some um, tools for this. This is a penetrometer that has a nice scale reading. Um, but honestly, my favorite a tool for this is my shovel. Um, if I'm out there trying to dig a nice little soil pit, and I encourage everybody to dig in their soils, um, if I'm out in the field, I, I'm digging as much as I can. But if I, you know, if I'm hopping on a shovel, and I'm using all my weight to dig my little soil pit, then I know I'm having compaction issues. I don't even need to take out the penetrometer. Uh, where the penetrometer is a nice tool is, you know, you start to see the resistance when you hit the 300 mark, but then you can try to push through that layer and see how thick, and see if you can push through it and see how thick, um, your compaction is if it's in the subsoil. 
And then there's some handheld steel penetrometers that people can use as well. But like I mentioned, my or a wire flag, a thermo flag. Um, some people use um, my shovel tends to be my penetrometer. <laughs> And then um, water stable aggregate aggregate stability test is one that um, you know NRCS has done these demos a lot, and sometimes people get a little tired of them. But <laughs> if you ever want to see a slaking demo, you, you know they're all over um, NRCS YouTube websites too. Um, but I I still really like them uh, because, and I like when I have a range of um, soils to slake. Um, you know, I, when I, I, and it's amazing when I have a good sandy soil and I can see that sandy soil that doesn't slake. I love that because it shows that it's not just about the texture. If you have the biology in that soil, a sandy soil will maintain its aggregate stability. And the same, the opposite is true of a high clay soil. If it doesn't have the biology of the soil, it doesn't matter if you have a high clay content, that, that soil will flake. But what I like about having um, the spectrum of different management systems, you know, maybe having a no-till versus somebody who is doing zone tillage or, or minimum tillage is seeing that middle of the road management that, yeah, my soil may still slake and the way the slake test it works, it's better, it, you know, you can do this in the field right away, but it's better if you let the sample dry, dry out and you want to sample from near the surface. Basically, you're trying to assess the, you know, the force of the water rushing into those core spaces that we talked about our mineral soil and organic matter and a biology in our soil being the bricks and mortar. Can those core spaces maintain their um, tunnels open under the force of the water rushing in or will those poor tunnels collapse and not allow the water in and then the, um, the sample just falls apart and we don't want that cloudy column. But it, even if we have the sample that falls apart and, and we want it to fall apart in chunks. And we want to see that water column stay nice and clear. Another way we try to indirectly um, assess our um, aggregate stability is by looking at the structure of our soil. You know, we always try to um, see if our surface soils have that nice granular cottage cheese look to them. You know, we, and that's usually a sign for us as good soil health. Um, it, but if we're starting to see those plates of platy structure from compaction, then that's usually a, a light bulb of something's going on here. Again, if, if that platy structure is near the surface, it's a lot easier to contend with because, you know, um, we have more biology on the surface than once it moves down to the subsoil or once people start subsoiling on a regular basis instead of you know, infrequently, they start to move that plow pad further and further down, and the more you move it down, the harder it is to treat. Um, when it comes to soil color, you know, I I have a couple caveats with soil color, and this is my homage to Long Island, because just because your soils are light and sandy doesn't mean you don't have good biology in your soils. You know, we're often thinking darker is better, but in soils that are intensively tilled, um, lighter, lighter is not always better because, I mean, darker is not always better because if we're putting a lot of stable compost that is, you know, it doesn't have necessarily the active fraction, but we're constantly telling so that we, our pore spaces are either being destroyed because we're destroying the structure in that tillage, or they're being collapsed and we don't have that biology in our soil, even though it's darker from, um, from residue input it's not going to have the aggregate stability and it will not keep those pore spaces open because of the constant tillage. So I mentioned minimizing the disturbance is, is um, one of the biggest challenges I feel like we have um, because 
it, it really is detrimental to our, our um, the biology in our soil, the infiltration of our soil, and it's trying to maintain that structure, structural integrity in our soil. So when we do compare soil color, we want to make sure we're comparing it to a nearby hedgerow, you know, trying to notice uh, is there a significant um, degree of uh, degree of difference between a hedgerow or, you know, you can compare it to a soil survey, but you really have to be careful that, you, you know, are you comparing apples to apples? Are you comparing a forested soil or to an agri you know, uh, crop field, making sure that you're comparing similar management systems. Um, so then our next field indicator are plant roots and um, and this is an, you know, this is one we can all do. Um, but we're looking for those, you know, J-shaped plant roots to give us an indicator of compaction. And and when we're looking at, for rhizo sheets, you know, we need to be a little cautious that we are comparing the same species of plants um, because different species of plants will exude different amount of sugars and exudates, so they have different abilities to maintain um, the, the aggregates of soil, but a nice healthy soil will be able to, uh, their roots will be able to hold all those natural soil pads in the soil, and we like to see that, that strength in our soil. Um, and, and these are all indicators that we will later use to assess any resource concerns that we may have. Um, so our next indicator is biological diversity and biocores. Um, I have this picture, I don't know how, you know, sometimes the colors don't come through very well, but that first one is from a horse pasture and it was actually a nice prime farm soil, but when you broke into it uh, because they had so much compaction and they really didn't have a lot of, you know, they had, um, they had lost a lot of their pore spaces. You can see there aren't a lot of roots throughout and it was actually glade. So it was giving us um, indicators that it, it really goes anaerobic most of the, a lot of the year. And so that is gonna um, change our aerobic system into an anaerobic system, which is not something we wanna see in our healthy soils. Uh, so we wanna see not just uh, if we want our pores, not just a lot of pore spaces, we want to see different sizes of pore spaces. Um, and we want to see if we can that connectivity of pore spaces. And, and you'll see these in whether it's a sandy soil or loamy soil, you know, no matter how dark it is or light it is, um, we should be able to see that re those really nice pore spaces giving us an indicator that these soils will have good infiltration and air flow through them. Um, you know, and we'll talk uh, when it comes to biological um, diversity, you know, so health and soil quality we need to do earthworm counts. And, uh, and now we're doing species counts. So we want to see at least um, three species, but even the earthworm count I liked because, you know, earthworms where they're distressed, they roll up into these little balls and they don't exactly hibernate, they call it estivation, and they can last and they like surround themselves into little mu mucus and little knots, which are kind of gross in a way, uh, but you know, we all do what we have to to survive. And they can last like that for over three weeks. So if we're digging in our axles where we would normally expect to find earthworms and we're not finding them at all, um, that's a really good indicator that you know something's going on. Um, why do I not have that biological diversity or why do I not have earthworms in a location that we expect to find them? Um, so these are all little clues to, you know, yes, we can send our soils away to be a lab to be analyzed and that's great, but you know, there are things we can do on our own to assess our fields. Um, so this is my final indicator, it's an infiltration. And I feel like with all these indicators, I had little caveats and, and this one has them too. Um, you know, we usually put a cellophane sheet or sometimes I even use a gallon size baggie so that um, when we pour the water where we uh, put it onto the cellophane first 
and then we're just pull the sheet out from under because we want to distribute um, the water evenly throughout the ring and do an infiltration, how long it takes for an inch of water to infiltrate. Um, so you really need to be careful when you're trying to get an overall distribution of your field to avoid those um, high traffic areas or those, you know, I, I kind of gravitate to, oh, this is that, this is that, or, you know, but you want to make sure you're accurately representing that field. So you don't want to go to the oddball areas, even though we're often attracted to them. Um, and you want to make sure you have lots of replicates because sometimes you'll find a really nice pour that just everything goes down or you hit a rock or, you know, it's this is a test that really requires a lot of replicates. So what uh, an inch of water in a ring is pretty close to a bottle of water. It's, I'm like, oh, that's just easy. It's always nice to bring a whole gallon with you so you can keep replicating this over and over um, throughout your field. And these are all tools that we're going to use to uh, make assessments of whether or not we have resource concerns and on our soil assessment tool that Amy will also go over. And then I'm just going to end with my final slides um, for making sure that, you know, this winter, um, um, yeah, everybody's out leaf peeking or a little path peek up here. But I also welcome you to go out there instead of just peeking at the leaves, um, peek at your fields and look out there and see how are we taking care of our microbes this year? You know, we go from October all the way to April sometimes uh, where our fields, um, you know, are they gonna have a living root in there? Are they gonna have food for the winter? Or are you putting your microbes on a seven month diet where they're not eating? And we all don't wanna go on a seven month diet. Um, so whether you're covering it with leaves or compost, uh, whether you have a small living cover out there, a nice tall cover crop. Um, I even like the, um, I appreciate all the community gardens who don't go out there and just clean off their boxes and leave them because they want them to look pretty, but they actually leave some residue out there from the, um, from the cropping season and maybe it's because they didn't have time to go clean it up but that's a good thing because we want to make sure those microbes um, have something to feed off in the winter so they can feed our um, plants and, they can, and so our plants can feed us and this is i guess so i'll turn it over to amy and if you guys have questions afterwards um, we can answer them after amy's talk Thanks very much, Olga. Um, that was great. And I think we'll just continue straight into Amy with um, more of the, about the carbon standard and what that actually might mean for farmers. So yeah. thank you, Olga. You're welcome. Hold on, I'm trying to stop. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm Amy Langner, a soil scientist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, my office is in Marcy, New York, which is near Utica. Uh, Mark did a great job reviewing composting and the benefits. I'm definitely going to be emailing with him. Um, Olga just reviewed soil health indicators and what we look at when we're evaluating soil health. I'm going to kind of combine their two presentations together and talk about a new NRCS standard for applying soil carbon amendments like compost in order to improve soil health. When checking your own land, you may notice some of the soil properties that um, Olga showed. Um, our new soil carbon amendment standard may be something to investigate um, and look into. The standard is being piloted in New York. You can see the other states where it's being offered. Um, so we're taking feedback. So Mark had a lot of good feedback. Um, Brandon, he's the, from the Soil Health Division. He actually helped write this, but you can send any feedback to me and I'll get it to Brandon. Um, he worked a lot on this standard and the standard is, is in the associated implementation requirements are found on eFOTAG. Um, this is what eFOTAG looks like. It is a public website. I'm just mentioning it because there's a lot of information here and a lot of NRCS time goes into keeping this up to date and we want the public to take advantage of it. So I went to New York section four, um, conservation practices and standards and soil carbon amendment and we have the standard and the implementation requirements here. Anytime I say the standard that's just required or the way that you're supposed to do the amendments or apply them. And then the 
implementation requirements is really an NRCS checklist to make sure everything's done correctly in order to um, pay for this if, if you're in a contract with us. So the soil carbon amendment um, standard, this is what it looks like. Um, it's basically applying plant and animal residues to approve the physical, chemical, and biological properties of the soil. And as Mark said, um, the, chemist, the chemical stuff, you, you might really not get an in, uh, increase by putting the compost down. You're actually getting a physical and a biological um, effect. And when we talk about soil health, we always want to talk about all three aspects of the soil, because if you just talk about chemical or just physical, you're really missing something. So I thought that was good that he brought that up because you really need to look at all three. So as he said and Olga mentioned, organic matter is really one of our most important dynamic soil properties. It changes with management and it affects other properties. So once you get organic matter in the soil and get it to stay there, um, we start seeing an, um, improvements in aggregate stability. So the organic matter binding the sandstone and clay particles together, creating a granular structure that looks like cottage cheese. Um, which creates a habitat for organisms. It creates porosity, pore space, and plant roots can go move through, so that increase, increases plant productivity and soil health. Um, and it also um, causes a better use of water because organic matter is like a sponge and it's easily available to plants when, it, or when the organic matter is present. And this um, adding amendments will also hopefully improve air quality by reducing emissions um, of, organic, of particulate matter. This um, carbon amendment can be applied anywhere. Um, we just want to be careful we don't apply it to like native areas where there are certain plant species or something that wouldn't benefit or changing communities or on fields where we're not going to be planting a crop soon. So we, this standard breaks up amendments into compost, biochar that Deb mentioned earlier um, in the poll and other carbon amendments. It also provides guidance on whole orchard recycling. So anybody out there, orchards, um, we know lots of times that people want to replace their orchards after 10, 15, 20 years, and they remove that matter. Well, this is a way to keep those chipped trees back on site so that we don't lose that organic matter from the site. Um, we don't ever mix um, in this standard any amendments with uncomposted manure or pre-blend them with soil. We also want to make sure we're using clean carbon. We don't want to have any contaminants um, from biosolids or sewage sludge, so we never have our source materials from those. And we also want to make sure that we're just using the, this is for the application of organic amendments, not inorganic amendments like limestone. So as I said, the amendment talks about compost and biochar and other amendments separately. Mark did a great job explaining the charts um, and the analysis that are done for for um, the different um, amendments. For compost, um, for this standard, it only has to be um, 10 to 1 at maturity and 40 to 60% moisture. And then he had mentioned the organic matter and bulk density, two other things that this standard requires to be recorded. So all that information from your um, analysis that's done on your amendment will be reported back to NRCS if you were to um, partake with this um, standard. And then biochar, we want to know the production method. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, it's a slow burning of, of material, so you get a really stable carbon byproduct. Um, we want to know the organic carbon, the ash content, the nitrogen, so all these things that will come from that analysis that's done. One of the big things with the biochar is we don't want to use crop residues that would benefit the field. So for instance, corn stouffer, it's on the surface, it's um, you know, taking the rain and it's not, it's um, minimizing the rain impact and it's covering the soil so it doesn't get eroded. And um, we wouldn't wanna take that material. We also wouldn't wanna take trees that are down in the woods that are providing habitat. We really wanna use material that's almost waste or would be, wouldn't be utilized otherwise. So for instance, wood chips from a logging operation or something. We also want to know the country of origin and the bi of the biochar, the feedstock, and the feedstock composition. There are a lot of other carbon amendments like um, coal ash, wood chips, sawdust, pulverized paper. Um, I know somebody who does the buckwheat hulls. Um, we, all those are great other amendments that could be added. Um, if there's ever a chance you think there might be a contaminant or we look at the source and we're like, hey, you know, this might have a contaminant, we do um, require Trace metal testing if we think there could be contaminants involved, especially something like coal ash. Um, so that is part of the standard as well. So for um, some of the criteria, so things that are required. And the reason I wanted to bring this slide up is because um, we are very conservative with this standard since we are just trying it out as a state. 
um, we are very conservative about excess nutrients and causing another resource concern. And I'll talk to Mark further about if we need to be this conservative. Um, but there, there are specific criteria here on when to apply amendment so that another resource concern is not created like water quality problems. So not applying during high wind events or to frozen or snow covered fields or when the top two inches of the soil are saturated or to steep slopes or to wetlands, um, to areas where the, um, that will not be vegetated for longer than three months following the application and where nutrients from the amendment will cause leaching or runoff. So when you look at all of that, that actually fits um, somewhat into something that we already have with NRCS, which is another standard, 590. Some of you may have heard of it before. It's nutrient management planning. Um, I hope this is not a barrier for small veggie farms or other small farms that want to apply and, and use soil carbon amendment. Um, I think there are planners out there that can help. Um, the reason it, you know, some people might see it as a barrier is you do have to get a, a, someone qualified to plan 590. Um, but I don't think it would be a complicated write-up, and um, I want to give you the situations where we would need it. So soil carbon amendment products have a CN ratio below 40, and that's something I'll talk to Mark about for the future, but we were really conservative here. We didn't want people applying amendments and getting a lot of extra nitrogen into surface waters, so this does apply to pretty much all compost. So if you're going to use compost as an amendment, you're probably going to need 590. Biochar products that are produced from manure and have a carbon content below 60% also would need a nutrient management. And if the manure, if manure is being applied to the same crop in, in the same crop year um, as the soil carbon amendment on the same field, those are all times we would need five nights. Um, I actually I don't look at it as much of a burden because I really like this idea of the soil health management systems. Um, as Olga said, even if you add the carbon, if you're still tilling a lot, you might have some soil health issues. So I really like thinking of it as a soil health management system. And 590 is part of that system. Um, so you might do 808, you might do 590, you might need conservation cover, you may need a, a conservation crop rotation. So when you have, um, when you show interest with NRCS, we might come out there, we might say, yes, 808 would be good here, but we might say other um, practices are good as well. Um, this chart comes from the soil health technical note that I have here. If you Google it, it'll come up. Um, it just talks about soil health management systems and how really it's a suite of practices often that we need to help our land. So where do we use it? This is this kind of follows up with what Olga was talking about. She talks about all the soil properties. Then we want to determine, are there resource concerns? Now that we've looked at the soils, we've recorded all this information about them, do we have soil organic matter depletion or aggregate instability or soil organism habitat loss or degradation? That's what we look for on the site visit. These are just some photos that I've taken through the years of doing soil health evaluations on soil. Um, and, you know, you see these resource concerns day in and day out, and we finally, I, I'm thrilled that this amendment is going to be a little bit quicker to get organic matter out on the soil than maybe waiting um, five, ten years for buildups from, from covers, which we also need, but it's just another added benefit. So this is the soil health evaluation form that's required with 808, but it's also beneficial for a lot of other things. It's also available on eFOTOG, so you have access to it right now in Section 1, Resource Assessment Tools. You'll notice the four soil health resource concerns in the upper right hand corner or left hand corner that this um, document is going to be able to figure out if those exist or not. A lot of these soil properties that we're looking at are exactly what Olga talked about. Once we figure out if things like ponding and surface crusting and soil color are issues or soil structure, then we have a flow chart where we will come out and determine, okay, you have pond and you have an issue with your plant roots, you have compaction, or you know, we'll go through these for each resource concern and determine if it exists. So how do you find out more? Talk to your closest NRCS field office. For many of you, it might be Liz. Um, the field office and soil scientists will visit the site. If you're on Long Island, it'll probably be Olga. Um, this, um, the soil scientists will determine if a resource concern exists using the, the sheets I just showed you. The field office will determine if nutrient management is needed and other possible soil health practices that I showed you in that chart. If nutrient management is needed, a nutrient management planner will be involved. This is just a quick, um, of New York showing you the purple area is what Olga covers, the blue area is myself, um, the tan area is Steve Page, and then out in Western New York we have Nicole Kabinsky. So we're all available to answer questions and help with site visits. These are just some cost scenarios just to give you a rough idea if you, if you did want to get involved with 808 through NRCS. 
We do pay to apply a greater than one ton per acre of compost, either imported or created on on-farm, that's a low rate, or we have greater than three tons per acre of compost, that's a moderate rate, and we also have that imported or on-farm. For the biochar, it's only imported. We do not have an on-farm option for biochar right now. And I think that's partially because it is a complicated process to create it and we wanna make sure that process is followed for, um, correctly. Um, greater than one ton per acre or four cubic yards per acre for that. We also have a compost and biochar mix that can be applied. The carbon byproduct, that's for trucking and spreading only and it assumes that the, that the byproduct is free like the gassy coal ash or wood ash. And then of course, the whole orchard recycling that I mentioned earlier, that pays for on-site grinding and chipping of whole trees during orchard removal and incorporation of those chips so that we don't lose that organic matter from the tree. And uh, lastly here, um, I wanted to mention that at RCS, we can't really make recommendations per se for private companies for where you're gonna get these amendments, but it's really important that you have an idea of where you can get the compost, where you can get the biochar, where you can get those other amendments. We don't want you to get into a contract and not have it. So it's something we will think about ahead of time. If you need um, sources, you might wanna to go to Soil and Water or to Cornell where they can make recommendations. This is a public website run by the Cornell Waste Management Institute that shows compost facilities. Um, some of these are private facilities that might be selling compost that you can get a hold of, um, but it's definitely important to have a source for your amendment. So with that, I'll turn it back to Deb. This is the contact information for the Soil Scientist in New York. If you have any questions, please always feel free to contact us. Excellent, thanks so much, Amy, um, for that review of 808. Um, for any farmers who might be interested in any of the NRCS standards, um, send myself an email, I can, I can get you in contact with Amy, Olga, um, and if you're on Long Island, Liz, um, or if you have their contact information or go on the USDA NRCS website, you can get their contact information there and ask them um, any questions you might have on that new standard as well as any nutrient management planning for your farm. Um, we did have a couple of questions for Amy and Olga that I wanna run by you to before Liz mentioned some of the EQIP programs or the cost share programs around soil carbon amendments. Um, first question is, um, last year I left the mostly finished compost on top of the soil without tilling it in until spring, but I noticed more insect problems during the following summer. Do you recommend tilling in in the fall? Amy or Olga, would you care to take um, a stab at that question? Of course, I'm kind of a anti-fall tiller, so I would I, I usually recommend to not um, till. Um, but I guess I would ask, what specific problem were you having in the spring? Um, it depends, you know, what 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 it was. Um, one thing you could do is after you have your compost is to plant a cover crop. And I don't know if you'd have time to do that or not, um, but that might be another benefit. Um, may help with the problem that you're having. Yeah, so I think um, we need to know um, a little bit more about your production system and exactly the, the situation, um, maybe where you're located. So um, if you could follow up with us, um, either myself or Amy or Olga with your question, we are happy to discuss your specific situation with you further. Um, second question is related to, is covering bare ground with mulch or compost for the winter an okay and effective substitute for a living cover? For example, in the case of not having time to establish a winter cover crop. It's a very common issue. I think many, many farmers experience this. Olga, Amy, any response to that question? Sure, I think um, anytime you can have a cover is always better than leaving your field bare. Um, it's just like, you know, if you're hungry, you'd rather have candy bars. Uh, you know, having some source of, you know, cover to prevent, not only prevent erosion, but something for uh, microbes to utilize as well. Um, obviously, living covers are better, but having um, some kind of mulch or compost is better than leaving it there. 
but it's not a, sub a substitute. No, it's not a substitute. <laughs> Now you want a living um, root system as much as possible. That would be your ideal goal. Something is better than nothing, but cover crops are preferred if you can. So thank you again, Amy and Olga, for um, sharing um, that information with us. I know it, we're already at six, but we have a little bit more information to share. So whoever can stay on, um, please stay on for another few minutes. Um, we would like to just, Liz Camps, um, who's the district conservationist um, with NRCS based in Riverhead on Long Island, is going to share a couple programs. And then um, Caitlin from Soil and Water, um, also based in Riverhead on Suffolk County, is going to mention a program specifically for Suffolk County growers, but potentially also other Soil and Water Conservation District offices around the state. Um, so please continue to stay on if you have a few more minutes. So Liz, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, if you could be brief, sorry, um, we've run out of time a little bit. All right. Can, can you see my screen? No, but I think I haven't given you co-host abilities. So now you should be able to share your screen. Right. Oh, well, it works. Oh, no. Oh, sorry. As my Mac is just telling me, it's security issues. Just one second. Hopefully it doesn't make me quit out of the, drink, the meeting. I'm sorry. Do you, do you want to try and just speak about the programs? Um, uh, sure. For right now, so, if, if that's easier. I just wanted to show you the screen because one of the pictures, one of the, um, I had a really nice presentation, presentation with pictures that I actually took myself from the visits that I do. And one of the pictures shows one of the applications with compost that the farmer is actually a nursery, but they only put the compost on top. And that's one of the questions that came up. And, um, and they have a very successful operation and he's been doing it for over 20 years. But um, I'm sorry, I can't show my presentation. But anyway, so if you, I guess you can see me at least. So if you are interested in applying for NRCS programs, please uh, get in touch with me. I'm in the same building as Cornell and Soil and Water Conservation District. If you've ever been at the Griffin Avenue location, that's where I am. I'm all the way at the back of the building. We have uh, different programs, but the main one that we use is EQIP, it's Environmental Quality Incentive Program. And that program includes, actually have it on my screen here, so I actually can tell you everything. That program includes all the practices um, that the, pre the, the first um, speaker talked about it, the composting facility. We've, we have a rate between seven uh, and $15 a square feet, if, um, depending what kind of facility it is. And these rates are based on 2020. They changed for 2021. I believe today was released a new cost list and it changes a little bit every year. And we have also practices for cover crop, uh, conservation cover, which is the permanent cover in between the rows. We have for fencing, mulching, um, nutrient management, pretty much all the practices that Olga and uh, Amy mentioned in the, in the presentations. So if you are interested, please give me a call and, um, or email me. I don't know if, uh, Deb, if you can show my, I don't know if you have my information on the screen or somewhere. But if you know, I'll give it to you right now. If you're interested to, to apply for any other programs from the EQ program, please call me at 631-332-6375. Again, it's 631-332-6375. And we can discuss all of them. I wish I could show you the presentation because it actually explains everything. But um, 
all the practices that we have will help you to improve the soil. If you have any issues with erosion, we can help you with that. We offer conservation planning assistant, so we can um, create a, a whole plan for you to help you and guide you through the whole process to improve your land. So if you have any questions, please give me a call, 631-332-6375, or my email is liz.camps at usda.gov. And that's it. Great, thanks so much, Liz. Apologies for not um, being able to share your screen and see your beautiful slides. I will enter in your information into the chat box yeah. um, just so people have that written down um, in case they did not hear you. So thanks very much. Um, Caitlin, could you share your screen and maybe take just a couple minutes to talk about the programs for um, the, the soil equipment loan program for how growers might be able to use more compost? Surely. Can you hear me okay? Yep, and can see your screen. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll just keep this brief. Um, I'm Caitlin. I'm a soil district te technician for Suffolk County Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, I've been working here for about two years and the soil equipment program is one of the programs that I uh, kind of facilitate. Um, so today I'm just going to be talking about the compost spreaders that we have specifically, but we do also have a no-till drill and a couple of zone builders as well. But today I'm just going to be um, covering the spreaders really quickly. Um, like I said, we have seven pieces of equipment. We actually just purchased uh, a Mill Creek 406 roll mulcher from um, the Lyrac facility, the Long Island Research um, facility that's owned by Cornell or run by Cornell. Um, so today I'll be talking about that as well as some of the other spreaders that we have. Um, so we have couple of different types of spreaders each one kind of I mean they all basically do the same type of thing but um, slightly different um, spreaders are a great conservation tool for moisture control and weed suppression uh, soil temperature uh, moderation and for adding organic matter to the soil which we've been learning this whole time um, the spreaders can be used throughout the year, so I've had growers um, reach out to me in the winter uh, asking if they could use it to put compost down while the, the ground is still um, somewhat frozen. Um, and they use it in the summertime too. All year round these spreaders are, are being used by growers. Um, so I will first be going over the New Holland 145 spreader that we have. Um, I have the specs here, but I'm not going to go over it. It's just for you to give an, get an idea of how big it is, what the load is, and all that. Um, so it has a heap capacity of 182 cubic feet of material. It requires PTO horsepower of 40. It can be trailered with a pickup truck. Um, I have been moving it to and from farms for growers to utilize. Um, so it can be easily moved. I believe it has highway grade tires, um, but don't want to drive too fast with them. It's just nice to drive a little bit faster than 20 miles an hour. Um, it doesn't have tailgates, so I have um, magnet lights that I hitch on the back of it. Um, that always comes in handy so uh, people know uh, when your hazards are on because it does cover the back of the truck. Um, but the, this um, spreader, is specifically designed to produce an even spread of material off of the back of it. Um, so it has these beaters that kind of kick the material off and it has a conveyor belt that is um, hydraulically um, driven. Um, and, and these pictures here, uh, a grower used the, the spreader back in February. So this is him using the spreader to um, displace um, duck manure in his fields. Uh, so you get a good visual on that. Um, the next spreader I'll quickly go over is the one that we just purchased, uh, the Mill Creek Roll Mulcher. Um, this one, the one that we purchased is from, it's a 1999 model, uh, but it works perfectly. This one's a side discharge 
uh, spreader. So this is great for row operations or, or smaller operations such as vineyards, uh, orchards, berries, uh, nurseries. Um, it's about five feet wide, so it can go down these narrower rows. It has a heap capacity of 5.4 cubic yards. It requires a tractor, a horsepower of at least 30. Um, this one's also PTO hydraulically driven, and this one can also be easily transported by us. Um, this one does not have highway grade tires, so I do have to drive a little bit slower with that. Um, but it, both of these have a simple um, hitch hookup uh, so we could easily move the sky around. Um, and this one, as I kind of mentioned already, is designed for side discharge of bulk material. You can either directly discharge the material to, uh, on the side or you can remote side discharge, which means you could control how far out you want to shoot the material. Um, it can go out several feet. You just have to kind of play with the control panels that are shown in these two photos um, and that way you could kind of gauge how much you want to shoot out the material for and you could use this for compost for mulch uh, wood chips mixes of topsoil anything like that um, this one's a pretty good one to um, use um, and right now this spread is being used um, for as to put uh, wood mulch in between orchard rows um, for weed suppression. So the next two um, are on the smaller scale. These We have two ABI spreaders. They're manually driven. Uh, they're great for even smaller operations if you just want to use it for maybe a row or two. Um, these only have a heap capacity of 50 cubic feet. So like I said, they're kind of small. Um, and there's no hydraulics. Um, associated with these. So these are fully ground driven. You need to engage the lever in order to use it. Um, and yeah, same with the other ones. These ones can be used for manure, manure mulch, compost, um, and things like that. So um, I know I wanted to keep this short and sweet. Uh, my contact and Debbie's contact information is here if anybody's interested in uh, learning more about our program or if you're a grower in Suffolk County want to borrow this equipment, uh, just reach out to us and we could try to put you on the list for now or in the spring or whenever you want to use uh, this equipment. And that's all I got. Excellent. Thank you very much, Caitlin, um, for sharing that. So that program Caitlin just mentioned about for the few people who are still on the webinar right now is specific to um, Suffolk County. Um, but please reach out to your um, soil and water conservation district within your specific county to see if they have any type of equipment loan program. Um, we know several districts do have loan programs um, where equipment is available for growers. So please get in touch with the resources available to you within your specific county. Um, and I want to make one more, I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Um, and for the final thing, for anyone who heard me mention biochar, but is really unaware of what biochar is um, or wants to learn more about it, and we know it's a relatively new soil amendment for, for many folks, even though from a science perspective, it's been around for several decades. Um, people are, the industries are just starting to adopt. Um, using it, as you can see um, with some of what we spoke about tonight. So I'm just going to share quickly my screen, whoops, um, about a, I lost it. I lost it. Maybe not. <laughs> Sorry. Of course, right at the end, <laughs> I messed up. Oh, there it is. Okay. Just going to share on the Cooperative Extension website that we have, we're hosting a biochar webinar series in the month of November. We have four separate dates and we're covering various different topics. So please check out the CC Suffolk web page uh, under events and um, you can learn more uh, about biochar there. So we know it's 6.16 now, so thank you for those who have stayed on. Um, 
listening to all the presentations. Thank you, Mark, Olga, Amy, and Liz from NRCS, um, and Caitlin for talking about compost and soil amendments today. And we will be sharing this recording with all those who have attended and on our website after this event. If you have any more questions, please follow up by email to anyone who has spoken tonight. We will also share that in a follow-up email. So thank you again and have a great evening. <laughs>